สวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับ Revolutionaries Hey I'm excited to bring you this week's episode with Ed Knuth otherwise known as Ed Kruntep who is a professor at one of the top universities in Bangkok Thailand these days and is also one of the pioneers of embracing digital cinema technology digital video where he was the mastermind of creating the Digital Cinema Expo right here in Cleveland Ohio almost 20 years ago and speaking of cinema this is timely because Right now, the Cleveland International Film Festival is going on, and we mentioned the film festival uh, in the episode. So I just want to give the CIF, C I F F, as it as it's known here, a shout out. And if you haven't checked out the Cleveland International Film Festival, please do. It's one of the best film festivals out there. But before we get to the episode, I just wanted to share the results of the 25 episode listener giveaway last week. First of all, thanks for all your emails, by the way. So the winner was Dave B from Colorado here in the U.S. and his favorite episode was episode 19 with Tom Mollier from i t r u c k e r s Dave says in his email that he loves the outdoors and listening to Tom's episode, listening to Tom speak so passionately about the outdoors in the episode, really made his day. So Dave, thanks so much for emailing in and your little reclining Buddha statue is on is on its way. So、I、really appreciate you listening. And when you get the statue, make sure you show it to all your friends and tell them about the show. That would be great. And again, if anybody out there is listening to the show and is really getting some value out of it, and is interested in dropping a review in iTunes or on the Facebook page, please do. It helps more than you know for getting the word out for the show. So let's get to this week's show where I talk to Ed about expat life and how he reinvented himself years ago from being a lawyer to dropping into Thailand. To becoming a teacher and then a professor at one of the top universities now, and most recently a podcaster. So he recently signed on to be the new co-host of the Bangkok podcast, the top podcast in Thailand for expats. I love this episode, so let's get to it. Welcome to Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast. The show that explores reinvention in the digital age as it relates to career, creativity, and technology. Stay tuned for interviews with professionals, entrepreneurs, and creatives that have reimagined success and are making a pivot. If you'd like to listen to the entire back catalog, visit JimJim'sReinventionRevolution.com for instant access. And now, here's your host, Jim Jim. Hey everybody, this is Jim Jim, and welcome to episode 26 of Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast. And I'm sitting here with Ed Knuth, and we're talking about expat life and the Bangkok podcast here in Bangkok, Thailand. So, Ed, welcome to the revolution. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here, Jim. Hey, well, thanks for coming over and fighting the Bangkok traffic. I did. How、I、was did. the ride over? What did you get stuck in? What were you riding in? Uh, well, I'm, I'm mostly a taxi guy.、Uh, that Bangkok's got actually pretty good public transportation, but I'm kind of spoiled and. Take taxis everywhere, right? Well, that's why I asked you because there's so many different modes of transportation. <laughs> that、right? is true. That、Maybe、is true. Tuk-tuk,、uh, motorcycle, taxi. That's right. Regular taxi,、uh, well, BTS the, train, the, the metro. The fastest,、uh, you know, the fastest are the motorcycles, but as you know, they're not always safe. <laughs> no, they're not. So,、um, yeah, that's that's. We'll save those stories for another podcast. But, okay.、Um, as we get into this, before we get into your story, which you, you have a very interesting story because you've been here seventeen years, and we're going to go over that、um, in a second here. What I wanted to ask you was, what did you think when you found out I was doing this podcast, and when you noticed that a picture that you took became the branding of the podcast? Well, I was proud of that.、Uh, we were just kind of messing around.、Uh, what was it last year or two years ago? Two, it was, la- it was oh, last. Oh, year. No, it was last year. That's right. Yeah, last year we were up in、uh, Chiang Mai and then Chiang Rai. Thailand, which is in the far north, and、uh, Jim saw this clock tower and kind of set up a photo, and and、uh, here we are. That's right. So last last year, I was kind of joking around, thinking about, you know, oh, let's take some pictures. You know, maybe I'll use it for the podcast. And I was joking around that I would even start a podcast. So it's kind of funny that that、uh, picture became the the cover of it. I mean, I,、yeah. I, I never really thought about it at the time. It was just like, oh, we're just taking funny pictures and stuff. But now it's been kind of kind of become kind of a thing. But I wanted to recognize that, and there's a couple pictures, other pictures, and that picture was taken with my cell phone. That's right,、I、which we、so. figured out just recently. <laughs> we were trying to figure out, a, a, trying to get a better high res image of it, but it just is what it is. But there's a couple other pictures that are on the website,、um, Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution dot com, that you took with your regular camera, which are much nicer, cooler pictures. 
There's one, and those were taken at the, I think it was the roof, rooftop of the Radisson Blue. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Hotel, right? At one of your gigs, yeah. Yeah. So we were, we were jamming one night with uh, with Ryan and T, and Ryan uh, just did episode 25. So if you're listening to this and haven't listened to episode 25, you should listen to episode 25. For sure. Um, you'll find out who Ryan was, and he plays guitar and such. But yeah, those pictures are really cool. And so I've been here in Thailand again this year, so we've been taking some more pictures, so maybe uh, some more of those will will make it onto the yeah website sure. or into the podcast yeah, we've which is cool. and, and uh, today we'll be taking uh, many more yeah so where are we going today we are going uh, to ayutthaya which is uh, the ancient capital which is only about 90 minutes north of bangkok and it's got some great ruins and hmm. it's really a, a, in general uh, i'm not a big fan of tourist type stuff but uh, ayutthaya is worth it okay all right well i'm excited to go and thank you for turning me on to onto it and ed's uh, been a great tour guide whenever i come over here and of course uh one of my best friends from you know all through, through the years of junior high starting in junior high that is, that is correct <laughs> so we go that back is, a long ways yeah. um but i'm excited i'm excited to have those pictures on there because you're you know right now you're you're the official photographer of jim jim's reinvention revolution thank you very much i'm proud <laughs> proud <laughs> so um but uh there is a link to that. that's why i bring this up just i wanted to get get get, get your thoughts and uh because i remember when you were back in cleveland you were uh, before you moved to Thailand, so I want to kind of get back get back to your story a little bit here. You were working in you always love technologies, and you're working in all these different things, and you're working on this thing called the Digital Cinema Expo. That is correct. Yeah, do, I, uh, do you even remember this? Of course, I do. It's been yeah. so many so many years yeah, ago. Yeah. Well, basically, I've always uh, uh, I've always been into both photography and computer. So back in the day in junior high, we, both of us were both of us were computer nerds, kind of. And, uh, but I also got into film photography and then, uh, in the, and, and basically I've always also been like a film watcher, you know, never a filmmaker, but, a, but into film. And, uh, I, you know, my, my initial career was in law and I went to law school at the university of North Carolina. And then I moved to Chicago and was a lawyer for five years. And, uh, when I got sick of that or decided I didn't want to be a lawyer anymore and I moved back to Cleveland, our, our hometown, and I just happened to get a job at uh, the Cleveland Film Society, which puts on the Cleveland Film Festival, uh, which is uh, for, for uh, I'm sure there's, you've got a lot of Clevelanders listening. Uh, Clevelanders know that we have a very good film festival. Um, it, we kind of punch above our weight, I think. Uh, I mean, oh, technically, you know, I think far above our weight. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's one of the best in the nation, I yeah, think. I mean, technically, it's regional. I mean, people would right. call it a regional festival, right. but... It's pretty damn good. It is. It's it pretty, is. It's, I mean, I mean, Cleveland's got many cultural things like that. I mean, the orchestra is the most obvious thing where we're just punching way above our weight. Right. Right. Uh, and, <laughs> and the film festival is pretty good. And we, um, and it just so happened that because I had this interest in technology and, um, and and uh, and computer stuff, that I kind of convinced them to start showing uh, uh, some film shot on digital video. So this was in the late right. '90s. Right. And this was uh, in the late '90s. Was kind of a technology. Uh, technol- another technology revolution mm-hmm. in digital video. Right. And it, digital video was starting to get better. Like in the past, video always looked so much worse than film that filmmakers never shot on video. Right. And the digital video started out just being a few steps closer to film. And uh, so what ended up happening there is they were amenable to uh, showing a few films. Uh, but I wanted to do like this whole big digital video thing and they weren't totally down with it. And right. so... Uh, I just decided to uh, do my own thing. So I, I and it, it wasn't the first, but it was actually, so this would have been uh, 99, I think. Is that, is that what year it was? 99? 98 or 99. And I think it was one of the first. I think it was like, 98. It was a little earlier, I thought. Yeah. It was, I think it was actually one of the first digital film festivals in the U.S. It was not the very first because when I did it, I knew there, there was a, a couple other showcases around the U.S. Right. But uh, so I set up right. this thing called the Digital Cinema Expo and uh, we, we showed all digital films, and we even had an uh, Academy Award winner come, a, a Japanese filmmaker named Keiko Ibi, who uh, shot a film on digital video that won an Academy Award, and so she came. Yeah, yeah, I remember it was a pretty big deal, and I thought it was really cool, and you were, at that time, on the cutting edge of, of this stuff, because there wasn't many people doing this. Yeah, it was, uh, it was brand new, and for some reason, I, you know, it was funny because, uh, I, you know, uh, just like you, I mean, I, I, I'm kind of a have my foot in a couple different communities of people and uh what i noticed when i was hanging out with all my film friends filmmakers and stuff 
is that they, they were not technology people. Right. Like, as in most, right. Musici- most musicians are not technology people. Right. Um, and uh, what I noticed is that they, as film people, they just looked down on all forms of video. It, w- w- which really yeah at that to, time because it was just starting to come up yeah, people w- were really w- underestimating it right that's right w- which really used to be true and you know mm-hmm. and i it, w- once video went digital and just my you know i i knew that anything digital is going to have its own problems and limitations but it can get better faster sure because you can, you can always just up the bit rate you know you know you know, <laughs> right. you know with analog stuff you can't it's not so easy to do that right, right. but with digital it's got issues and problems and stuff but it's just every year there's going to be more bandwidth. Yeah, and computing, so, you know, capabilities, capacity, uh, GPUs, all those kind of things are just evolving very fast, as we can see, of course, now. So I remember arguing with my boss at the film festival. Um, I kept telling him like, "This stuff's going to get better. We got to jump on top of it." Like, you know, and uh, you know, he did. Uh, I got to give him some credit. Um, he 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 was some. I would say he was somewhat open minded, and he did allow us to show some digital video at the festival. But you know, it wasn't really their mission. They right. weren't like a technology thing, and so yeah, right. It wasn't their mission, their mission, but yeah, yeah. It was cool that you were into it, and I just thought I, I uh, mentioned that to give you know people a perspective, a background, and props to you in terms of just uh, being uh, an early adopter of technology. I guess that is know? true. Well, the fact one of the fascinating things is, uh, I mean, uh, you know, I, I'm jumping a little bit ahead in my story, but uh, you know, now I teach at this university here in Thailand, and uh, my, my expertise is really teaching uh, 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 about American politics because I have this background in law, but I also uh, wormed my way into teaching uh, American film classes and uh, documentary film class. So it's like I'm still, so my students right now are shooting films on digital video. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. You didn't tell me that you were teaching film classes. That's yeah. neat. That's yeah. cool. Cool. Well, let's, yeah, well, so let's uh, circle back to your story a little bit. Thanks for just uh, spending some time on that. So <laughs> I just think it's very, very interesting and neat. And um, uh, I think you could have done a lot with if you stayed in like the digital cinema, like you know, Lane. You could have really done a lot as it grew. In looking right. back on it now, man, you would, it was you were really. Oh yeah, we you could have grown early. that whole franchise of the digital cinema expo and sold it off probably. And yeah, we were there early, man. All kinds of stuff going on. Yeah, that was really cool, and that was happening in Cleveland. So, anyways, uh, so but you're still still living in Cleveland at this time, and what was the impetus why you decided to dive into, you know, basically moving and. And, yeah, and well, taking a job overseas when you really, at this point, uh, you know, as we discussed, hadn't traveled out of the United States much, really overseas right. at all. Well, as I'm sure your listeners will appreciate, uh, I was trying to reinvent myself. It's <laughs> really what was going <laughs> on. It, was, was that really like the, the, your thought process back then? Like, man, I got to change things up or do something different? Or uh, It definitely was that, um, al- although in a somewhat random way, which, which has some value. Like I am... Um, basically I knew I didn't want to do law. And so, I mean, you know, this is not an uncommon thing among young lawyers where you, you get kind of quickly disenchanted. So after Mm -hmm. about five years as a lawyer, I I was just realized I don't want to do this rest of my life, but I did not really have an alternative plan. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you spend so much time in school up until that point and you're very focused and narrow and you're like, Oh my God, this is not for me. What do I do? Yeah. And now when I was a lawyer, I started doing some part-time teaching on the weekends and just enjoyed teaching, but I didn't have the proper, I didn't have a teaching certificate. I never had a master's in education. So I couldn't really just all of a sudden start teaching, uh, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a formal setting. And right. I just happened to, uh, through some friends, I happened to stumble on a job here in Thailand that was supposed to be a year-long contract Mm -hmm. and it was teaching stuff that I could teach it was teaching stuff like uh, the SAT or uh, the TOEFL which is like the test of English as a foreign language which is pretty easy for a native speaker to teach like you didn't really need right proper training it's not it's not like really being an English teacher Mm -hmm. you're just teaching the test I see Um, and so they pretty much hire uh, the company I worked for here they pretty much just hire college graduates so I I was kind of overqualified as, as someone with a law degree but if you if you have a good college degree, they would hire you to come over here and teach, tests, basically teach test stuff. Okay. And um, I really was uncertain about coming here for a year. Um, you you and I talked about it before I moved, and I really was untraveled. I mean, I think I'd gone to Niagara Falls, and I think I crossed the border to Mexico, maybe. But basically, I was untraveled, right. so I was really worried about it. And so I remember by email negotiating with my with my company and. Getting them to reduce the contract to six months, 
which is funny because yeah, they wanted you to be over here for a year, right? Yeah, and I okay. was so uncertain. I was like, ah, a year. I don't know if I can do that. Right. And uh, and basically now it's that was seventeen and a half years ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's I didn't really insane, right? Yeah, yeah. So I, yeah, it was it was a really big deal. And but but it was like you said before, it it, it was somewhat random in that I was just like, I got to do something I've never done before. Mm-hmm. I, I got to just roll the dice and see what happens and, and get right. some get some kind of worldly experience like okay. like obviously I'd, i've been in school my whole life and then i had some work experience right uh but that's not the same as just kicking around and, and no and no. seeing the world you know exactly exactly so yeah i think it's uh it's fascinating and that you know and i'm sort of kind of coming to this part maybe just over the last few years i mean i've traveled a bunch for work being in the corporate world and you know got to go to japan and paris and germany and different places when i you know work for general motors or was in telecom which is cool and it kind of informs you but it's different going over and spending longer amounts of time in, in a place to really kind of get to know the culture or, or even living here and having having to deal with just the structural things of a bank account and and visas and all, all those kinds of things so uh, i mean at least, at least you had an entree into coming over here but what what was the what was the culture shock like uh, when you got here, having really been untraveled, and you get here, and what did you think of of this place when you got here? Like, what were you thinking? Like, oh man, this is too much for me, or this is crazy, or I want to go home. Or... Oh well, it's a it's a great question. I, I probably have the, my answer might be too long, but I guess we <laughs> I, I guess we got some time. Yeah, well, that's the beauty of podcasts. It's uh, a <laughs> yeah, yeah. long form. Uh, but yeah, basically, here. I, I didn't. I knew very, very little about Thailand before I moved over here. I'd actually, utterly coincidentally, I happened to date a girl in in college who had who 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 was American, but who had gone to international school in Bangkok. So I just, I all I knew was her her stories about living here. I didn't know much about it. Was and, was there a choice? Was there a choice when you found these openings of different countries to go to? Or, or, or this just one in this particular, one I probably could have. This one in Thailand. particular, this one in particular was just here, okay. like only here. So I didn't really have a choice. I got you. Um, and, uh, you know, I, obviously I knew very basic things about Thailand, you know, right. elephants, you know, Thai food, you know, <laughs> elephants, okay, orchids, Thailand's known for right. its orchid, you know, I had right. some vague associations. And I remember when I got on the plane, uh, in Cleveland, uh, I had a layover in LA. I stopped in LA for a couple of days and then in the LA airport, uh, I went to the bookstore and I was thinking, I better read something about this country that I'm going to go live in. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. So, so I bought the book. Time uh, to get serious while like, you're on the plane. <laughs> there's actually a, yeah, right. There's actually a series of books labeled Culture Shock. And it's like, you know, Culture Shock, you know, Laos, Culture Shock, Cambodia. So I grabbed the Culture Shock Thailand book. Oh, I never heard of those. Yeah. Oh, I'll have yeah. to check so that out. Yeah, That's cool. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, just a tra- another travel book, yeah, but they, right. they focus on culture. Gotcha. So I grabbed the book Culture Shock Thailand and I read it on the plane. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting, uh, now that I've been here a long time, the, the, first off, the, the books aren't bad at all. But, but, but I think that they, those books, in my opinion, they focus really on traditional culture, and, which is definitely uh, exists, or obviously it's a real thing. Right. But, like, for example, I remember reading in that book that, where they talked about how Thai couples won't hold hands in public. Mm. Uh, and they also said that Thai people uh, don't, uh, don't like to wear shorts, even though it's a very hot, uh, humid cu- country. Right. And, uh, it's funny because I, I read that in the book. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so I just said, well, you know, when in Rome do as the Romans do, it's like, I can't wear shorts. And so, uh, I was very serious when I first got here. Like I want to, I don't want to be disrespectful. Mm-hmm. So I wore jeans and long pants. Right. And I, I really did that for, uh, uh you know, I ended up re-upping my contracts, but so about the first year I, I just, didn't wear shorts at all and then i just started opening my opening my eyes <laughs> you know just and, watching to see what everyone else was doing you know instead of just following the book and I, right. i'm looking around and i'm like wait a minute like a lot of thai people are wearing shorts and i'm like oh wait there's a thai couple holding hands over there <laughs> <laughs> and you know right. and you know and i realized that um you know i you know, they were just wh- looking at it from the the traditional historic point of view. That's this right. Is kind of how ties would be and normally. And also, but, uh, you know, I, right. I, I, you know, I can't. I, I'm no expert on Thai history or or even Thailand. I guess, I guess compared to most of the listeners, I know more because I've been here. Right. But one, the, like, if you want to understand Thai culture, the one key fact to realize, the one overarching fact, is that Bangkok is very different than the rest of the country. Right. That's like right. the overriding thing that, that that makes Thailand very different than the United States. Right. Uh, because in the U.S., uh, we have a lot of regional differences, and everyone realizes the regions are not the same. 
Uh, and we do have an urban rural split. That's a big theme. You could, sure. argue, you could argue it was a big theme in the last election, et cetera. Right. So that exists. But in Thailand, just you have to multiply that by 100. It's like the right. It's a more extreme for sure. Massive urban you know, rural. Just like split. you can't judge the U.S. by New York City, for example, right. or whatever. But it's probably more extreme. Yeah. Here, but right? it, it, I mean, imagine if New York was the only big city. Right. You know, that's the best way to think about it. Imagine if there was New York and every country was like under 500,000, every city was under 500,000. Right. <laughs> like that, 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 that's basically, that, that's basically Thailand. Right. So my, one of my buddies uh, that I teach with at my university, he likes to say, you know, he likes to remind me, uh, you know, we don't live in Thailand, you know, we live in Bangkok. Right. You know, right. and it, it's really true. I mean, right. Bangkok is its own island. I mean, it's huge, obviously, you know, but it, but it really is like its own country. Right. And it's about, it's a little bit listed, I was just looking at, a list, listed like 8.2 million, something like that population, official population of Bangkok. But I'm sure that price swells with people commuting into the city and Yeah, whatever, so kind of know. famously, the, the um, t- w- w- another uh, quirky aspect of, of Thai culture and law, I guess, is um, t- the... In the U.S., kind of like your standard piece of ID would be your driver's license. Like that's what you need to show at different places. And all the, we do have other forms of ID, but in Thailand, the, the key form of ID is a, a, a document called a Tabian Ban. And a Tabian Ban is actually your residence uh, 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 identification. So every Thai person has to have a document that indicates where they live. And that's the key thing to open a bank account to do whatever you want. It's not a driver's license. It's a Tabian Ban. And... Um, so the Tabian Ban is what they use to measure population. So, so when okay. you read about Bangkok's population being 8.2 million, mm-hmm. when I got here, I think it was six, you know, okay. 15 years ago. Right. You know, um, that's actually just the Tabian Bans in, in Bangkok. I see. So the actual population is uh, now uh, probably 12 million yeah. in terms of people who live here because their, their, their property registration is just outside the city because they come here to work for years. I see, right. But they're right. still on the top, top yeah, of the mantra outside the city. I was going to say it feels like it's bigger than 8 million, just yeah. being having traveled around a I little bit. I think it's it's 12. It could even be more. Yeah, because when know? you get on the BTS trains, you're like, wow, this is a lot of people, <laughs> you know. And they're like, you know, you're queuing up in lines everywhere, and it's just it's a very... Uh, it's huge. It's huge, yeah. It's huge. But it's, it's interestingly, it's sort of every, it's sort of kind of like a like this moving kind of growing organism where it's everything seems to work together more um, smoothly than other places I've been though. Well, it's interesting. Um, just, uh, just the, the, another ironic thing about me considering I lived over here for 17 years, I'm not a traveler. So I, I wish I was. And I, you know, before I got here in my head, I was envisioning that I'm going to travel all around Asia and you know, I'm going to be become a travel guy. And what I realized is that, I don't really like it that much. And so, I mean, I've, I've, I've been to Japan, right. I've been to Cambodia, but considering how long I've been out here, right. I haven't traveled that much. I mean, I mean, I like Jim has been to more places in Asia than I have. Like, <laughs> like yeah. I, you know, so I, I yeah. don't actually, I don't actually travel really that much. Um, but my friends who travel a lot, they always joke about how, you know, the normal thing when you when you get exposed to Bangkok is you can't believe how chaotic it is. Mm-hmm. Like everything it appears, right? Just so chaotic, right? But my friends tell me that you know when they travel to other places, whether it's India or China, basically they say that it's it's chaotic over there, and nothing works. You know, it's like right. it's, it's like it's like like you know, um, like. Bangkok traffic seems bad until you go to like Mumbai or something like that. Right, exactly. And, and it, it's just, that's exactly my impression. And I've actually been, been to Mumbai. <laughs> right. Right. So it was like, yeah. So it's strange. I mean, this is one of the, one of the cool quirks of Thai culture is it, it's, you, you, it looks like nothing is going to get done. Like, like when you're kind of like right. watching the operation of stuff, you're <laughs> like, oh my God, like this is all going to fall apart any minute now. Right. Um, but then it doesn't. But like, somehow it doesn't, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like t- Thai people are actually pretty good at getting stuff done. I mean, all things considered, uh, e- even though it doesn't look that way, or their style right. is very different right. than in the West. I think. Yeah, the well, it's, it's you know, it's that's the world, the way the world spins. You know, things are different. It's just a culturally different place. But uh, cool. Well, okay. So let's let's go back to uh, a little bit. You, you know, you drop in. You're working on this these contracts, I guess, initially that you're like, hey, I had to re up after six months, or or you re up for another year. But at what point do you decide that uh, you're going to stay longer, or why did you decide to stay longer? How did that kind of evolve well, in your mind? Well, I didn't really get a chance to finish my point, or I got sidetracked somehow. Oh, and I was so I was going to say that you know I bought this culture shock book, and then when I got here, uh, 
there really was not a lot of culture shock, you know. Wow. So, so okay. you know, because I was coming to Bangkok, and Bangkok is Bangkok is very much a first world country. It has it has all kinds of nooks and crannies that you were that tell you that you're in the third world. So there's a lot of nooks and crannies. Right. But anyone who's been to Bangkok knows that it's um. I mean, it's it's certainly more advanced than Cleveland is in terms of like public transportation. Oh, you know, we absolutely. have a we have a sky train. We've got a subway. Right. You know, we've got uh. You know dozens of skyscrapers so i mean it's it's mm-hmm. considerably bigger and in, in many ways more modern th- than cleveland is for sure right uh, and so my my joke I, I i always tell my students you know when i when i describe to them what it was like for me to come to bangkok is i always tell them how disappointing it was to come here because i was really looking forward to an adventure mm-hmm. and then when i took a cab to my apartment when i just got into bangkok i got to my apartment and i was looking down the street and at the end of my street here in Bangkok was a McDonald's and a Starbucks. Right. <laughs> and I was like thinking like, wait a minute, like in Cleveland at the end of my street, there's a McDonald's and a Starbucks. Right. <laughs> and KFC. Yeah. I was like, know, all these brands are here. Yeah. Know. So I was a little bit disappointing. You know, I'm like, wow, I'm moving all the way around the world. I'm going to have this crazy Asian adventure. And then there's McDonald's, Starbucks, KFC. It's like, so it's, so uh, this is one of the allures. I think one of, one of the cool things about Bangkok is that, um, you you can kind of control your exposure to Thai culture. Yes, and it's like so you you know it's it's a very diverse city, and there's you know it's very international, and and essentially there is kind of a even though I don't travel that much, I know from my friends there's kind of an international kind of monoculture which is the same everywhere, and so if you're talking to educated people or English speaking people, mm-hmm. you could go almost anywhere in the world and you can eat at American restaurants. Or, or things similar to there's kind of an international standard, okay, right? And right. And, and and Bangkok has that. So right. I mean, you you could come here and uh, just learn a few words of Thai and basically be fine, you right? Know, you know, and so you, you I, I would say my culture shock was close to zero. I mean, mm-hmm. it, you know, at, at first, you at know, first, yeah, in, until I on the surface when you yeah, first yeah, got exactly here. Yeah, exactly right. Sure. And, and you know, the longer I've been here, and the more I know Thailand and Thai people, and I've been married to a Thai woman for uh, eleven years now. Um, obviously I know I've had many other, other experiences where I've been shocked by stuff, but, it, but the, the cool thing is when you come here to travel, you can avoid that, you know, right, right. You're, you're not immersed in, in, in Thai culture. Yeah. You can, you can kind of get into it or back, back away from it. Or like, I find this actually myself when I'm here where it's like, you know, I kind of get into being in Thailand, like, Hey, I'm in Thailand. So I'm like doing Thai experiences and eating Thai food and doing things with, that they would do. And then all of a sudden it's like. I find myself, man, I just need some fast food today or right, I need right. like a, a little bit of a more of an American experience. And no doubt, no doubt. I need to go to the mall and walk around or something, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. And, and shop at the high end shops and stuff and uh, which which they have, which is which is nice. So so you, you're working for this just kind of. Circle yeah, back yeah, yeah. A, a so so basically so um, uh, there was not a lot of culture shock and um, I basically enjoyed being here. And, and, and part of it was the fact that I was pretty untraveled. So for me, it, it did become an adventure. I mean. Even though there was a Starbucks and a McDonald's at the end of my street, I immediately started to meet a whole bunch of cool people. Uh, for me, it was kind of a big deal just to meet um, uh, people from Sweden or, or meet people from Denmark or you meet, you like have a British friend or an Australian friend. Like I just mm-hmm. never, I never right. had that. I never had that old international experience. Right, right. And here, there's an expat community and there's tourists all over the place. So for me, just traveling and you know, like being outside of the U.S. was was pretty mind blowing. So, so for me, right. Mike. My my cultural uh, experience that made it cool was not so much being in Thailand specifically. It was actually just being outside the U.S. Yeah. Uh, and so my, um, you know, whenever I meet Americans either here or, or when I'm back home is more appropriate. You know, I always tell them, leave the United States. Like, that's my advice. My advice to all <laughs> right. Americans right. is to get out. Right. Because right. I think it's, uh, it gives you such a perspective on the world. And it, like... From inside the U.S., it's just hard to get a, a, a to, to get a sense of what it's like around the world. And, right. and when I say get out, uh, that's not uh, meant uh, to be anti-American in any way. So I'm I'm definitely not one of those expats. Like I'm uh, living over here and teaching about the United States. I I'm pro- I think I'm more patriotic now than I was before because I think I think I can really see what we have of value. Right. You know. Um, right. But I've still learned a lot, so I so so I don't mean get out as in move away forever. 
I mean, like travel outside the United States yeah. and interact with people around the world. I think it's just, uh, it teaches you a lot about the United States. Right. Well, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree. And I, I like your point. And this is how I try to describe it to people too. Is like one of the reasons why I keep coming back here is yes, it's Thailand. Yes, it's cool. But you do meet all these other people from around the world. So you're, it, you know, it's it's like this is like a great place to come to really learn about the world because, you you know, you really can just run into anyone from anywhere almost, like being in Bangkok specifically, you know, not not in the smaller towns of Thailand so much. And, yeah, you get to learn and see their different perspectives and think about the world differently and just, you know, give you different experiences. So so that's cool. So obviously it's kind of like an attraction there that you just wouldn't get living in uh uh, you know, a smaller town in the U.S. or average sized right. town in the U.S., right? That's it's right. Not, it's not as cosmopolitan. I mean, you might have a similar experience in New York, for example, yeah, or, or yeah. San Francisco, but... Yeah, so I was getting the Bangkok experience. Yeah. And so for me, uh, after only a couple months, I realized, oh my God, I'm going to want to stay here. Yeah. Uh, you know, at least for another year. Yeah. And uh, my, you know, the uh, a kind of running a running joke amongst expats here is that we always think we're only going to stay one more year. So it's like, it's like <laughs> so very few expats say like for some reason people don't want to say hey I'm a lifer right. or, or 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 say or they don't want to say like I'm going to be here a long time. So everyone says like well I'll think maybe I could do another year. Yeah. And, it, and that, <laughs> that's really how I was honestly right. to be perfectly honest I think I was like that for about 12 years. Like yeah. it's only the last 5 years where I where I've been like whoa like uh, this is basically my home and I, I don't necessarily I don't know if I'll be here for life but I'm just like I'm kind of I'm and kind of here indefinitely, right? We, we, which which was obvious to anyone else after three years or something, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. But honestly, like every year, I was always thinking and you know, like, do should I do another year or not? And like, it was actually kind of a decision, right? And then it, it's really only the last five years where I just stopped thinking about it, right? You start you, you started being more comfortable with what with the reality of the situation yeah. instead of the took me the romance time. in your mind. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it took me a long time. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, because we I remember like you know we have obviously mutual friends at home in Cleveland. When we talk about her once in a while, and I remember this. You know, once you were here like three or four or five years, we'd be like, yeah, I don't think he's coming back. You know, what, what's he coming <laughs> back to? I mean, it's fun over there or whatever. And you know, you found a good job and, and such. So, in talking more about some you know the expat experience, I think some of the things that people worry about when they go to foreign countries or if they were going to live in a foreign country is the the structural things the bank accounts the visas and you know how do you and and healthcare. so one of the things you know like in a first world country especially like the united states especially being in cleveland for example is we have great health care there it's one of the top hospitals in the country in the world cleveland clinic etc uh but what's the healthcare system like here and i know you had some experience with the healthcare system because you had some some illnesses that you were it was kind of showed up and unexpected and that's got to it's got to throw a wrench in maybe your plans or your thinking of oh yeah I'm just having fun in this foreign country and then you get sick but how did you think about that you know well good question again well, pr- probably a long answer but <laughs> yeah so I was uh, here about two years and uh pretty much out of the blue I was diagnosed I was diagnosed with a form of abdominal cancer so uh I mean the, the story is actually pretty simple I I just had some stomach pain I happened to, I mean, basically I got very, very lucky because I, I lived next to an international hospital, which is quite well known, this hospital called the Bummergrad Hospital. All the expats know it. Um, Bangkok's got a bunch, five or six international hospitals, and I just happened to live right next to one. Hmm. And also, coincidentally, uh, I have pretty bad allergies, and so I, I had like a, an appointment with my allergy doctor okay. that day. Oh, interesting. So, I, you know, I just woke up st- with stomach pain and... Uh, I went to go see my allergy doctor, and she was like, "Hey, you you should go see uh, uh, an internal medicine person, you know." Or sent me down to talk to someone else, and uh, the guy like felt around the guy, the guy, the guy like felt around in my abdomen, and he's like, "Hey, let's do a let's do an ultrasound and see what's going on in there." Hmm. And uh, okay, you know, twenty minutes later, he's like, "You have a tumor. Are you free next Tuesday?" <laughs> Whoa, that was pretty much how it went down. Yeah, that's and, pretty. Uh... Uh, and so uh, pretty blunt, right? Yeah, yeah. There was no, uh, yeah, there was no hand holding. It was just like you know, he had like his calendar in, calendar in front of him, and like right. I think it was like a Thursday, and he's like, "Yeah, you need surgery. We gonna, mm. let's do the like, are you free on Tuesday?" And I was like, "Whoa, yeah." So it was, uh, yeah, it was a huge shock. Uh, so I know what it's like to get that diagnosis, and it's, uh, yeah, it's a very weird thing to hear. Um, but to answer your question more directly, uh, the healthcare in Bangkok is 
in general, very good. Um, uh, it, it, you know, there are levels of healthcare here. So w- one of the things about Thailand and Bangkok in particular is that you can exist here at any economic level. So, mm-hmm. so, so I think it's a, a, a plus. So you, yeah. you can, you could live, you could live very, very cheaply in Bangkok because there are many, many poor people in Bangkok who've come from outside the city and they, they live in Bangkok and they, they don't make that much money. And so I, I think, I think this is different than most American cities. Well, but, yeah, let's, let's stay on this point here for a second. So what you're talking about is the, is the cost aspect or the cost and quality ratio or how would you describe it? So you, so you, you know, you experience this thing, you, it's like you have a real illness that you have to deal with the medical system because this is like an issue, I think in the United States, you know, uniquely, I think kind of in the world in a way where it's like, we have this sort of, you know, capitalist system and we have to pay for healthcare in these different ways. And it's not universal healthcare and people get so, uh, uptight about if it is universal healthcare, somehow the quality is going to drop or something what's the structure here and how does how do they view the cost and and how do people pay for it okay uh the 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 answer is that thailand has a a government-based healthcare system which everyone everyone knows it as the 30 baht healthcare scheme 30 baht is is about a dollar Uh, and and essentially the 30 baht healthcare scheme is and we should say that the baht is that's the form of currency in thailand people have never heard yeah the thai baht so 30 baht uh, i think uh, i think uh, a dollar is 33 baht right now um, so a 30 baht healthcare scheme is about one dollar, and it basically means you can get medical treatment at any uh, at any government hospital for one dollar. So a- anything you're anything that's wrong with you, it's one dollar. Uh, so essentially, it's free. You know, more or less. You, you know, it's essentially wow. free healthcare. Um, however, the 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 30 baht healthcare scheme it has some of the problems that a lot of universal healthcare systems have. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously as you guys know and your listeners know it's a complex debate so right. but uh so the the government hospitals do tend to have waiting lists especially in bangkok because it's so crowded right um so you and so i i've actually done b- because of my cancer treatment i i i basically had a tumor removed uh, you know which was surgery but um I avoided doing a more complex exploratory surgery to see if the cancer had spread. Mm. So I had a couple options. Okay. And uh, the surgery to remove the tumor was fairly easy to do. But another treatment option was to do uh, an extensive surgery looking at lymph nodes and stuff like that to see if it had spread. But I, I chose, I chose a, uh, an option called surveillance, which is really just keeping a close look on your body to see if the cancer is still there. I see. And so basically I had to do about, uh, I did uh, 20 CT scans over five years. So I started I out with uh, six CT scans the first year, four the next year. And so they, they, they give you a whole bunch of CT scans and they start spacing them out. I got you. Um, and right. it's just the CT scans are just to check. So I took the, that option. And, and, and how much is like a CT scan? Just like the, you know, kind of regime, like, is it 10 bucks, 20 bucks, thousand well, dollars? Well, let me get back to my explanation. So the, so I live next to, so, so Thailand has this government healthcare program, but next to it, they also have private hospitals. Sure. Okay. So they have private Thai hospitals and they have private international hospitals. And so, Thai people have a choice, so they, they can just they can just enter the government system. Everything costs a dollar, mm-hmm. but depending on where you are, uh, you might ha- you're going to have to deal with a wait. So sure. um, uh, at at different times, I have gone into the government hospitals, and basically you you show up at six a.m. and you 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 get a queue, you know, and you might mm-hmm. not get treated till three p.m. or something like that. I so see. it is it is a wait really? here. Okay, you know it, it is for real. That's but it, it, uh, uh, what what I know from experience and what my friends have told me and what I've read is that it, it really depends on where you are. And I have uh, uh, Thai friends as well as some foreign friends who sometimes what they'll do is they'll just go to a town outside Bangkok. You know, yeah, like, sure. You know, because the government hospitals there are just much less crowded, less crowded, so the you, you know, less. Yeah. yeah, and it's also very cheap. So you, you take, you know, if you, if you need to have something serious, you just go a couple of days outside the city. And and you and you hang out there, and the government hospitals are not as crowded, and you can gotcha. you don't have to worry about the wait. Um, so I was in the, you know, so it's it, roughly you. So there's this three tiered system. You know, there's the government hospitals, which are almost 100 percent Thai. If you go in there, there's almost no right. white people in there. Right. Just a few guys like me who've lived here a long time. Right. Sometimes you know. Yep. And then you go into like private Thai hospitals, uh, which is still mostly Thai, but uh, some foreigners there. And private Thai hospitals. Uh, are, 
I think the metal carrier is good, and it, it's just obviously not one dollar. You know, so sure. it's, you know, <laughs> it's so higher. the private high hospitals are still very cheap uh, compared to uh, a, an American hospital. So, right. like for example, uh, let's see, what's a good example? So if you if you uh, if you need, let's say, just an X-ray for something. So for example, uh, to get a Thai work permit, uh, which has to be renewed every year, you need to get uh, a chest X-ray. Basically, I think if you went, so if you went to a government hospital, it's essentially free, okay? Right. If you go to a private Thai place, it's probably going to be about uh, oh, maybe 1500 baht, so that would be about $50. Right. Like the doctor visit and the x-ray would be about 50 bucks. And then if you go to uh, an international hospital, it might be twice that, probably about 100 bucks. So, you know, so to go in, talk to the doctor, get get the exam, get an x-ray, it's about a hundred dollars, right. e- even at the international hospital. Right. So even at the very high end, it's just about a hundred bucks. Yeah. Yeah. Now, of course, uh, the international hospitals can can be a lot more expensive than that, depending on what your problem is or how long you're staying. So it is possible, you know, to rack up big bills at these international hospitals. Sure. Uh, but still, it would be considerably less than in the U.S. Yeah. I mean, that's the interesting thing that you have these three different tiers kind of choices. And no matter what, they're all less expensive. <laughs> Absolutely. For very good care. Absolutely. You know? uh, for example, I had a friend who suffered a horrible motorbike accident, which is not surprising if you know anything about Thailand. The motorbikes are really dangerous. I, I have a friend who basically just got run over by a truck um, and spent uh, 30 days at one of these high-end hospitals. Um, and it was uh, about, uh, let's see, it was about $12,000. That's it, $12,000. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, which is $12,000 is not a small amount of money, but he's yeah. 30 days in a private room at like a high-end facility right? undergoing a lot of medical treatments. Right. Like, you know, broken leg, cracked ribs, like uh, like hip, uh, he had a fractured hip, like all these kind of things. And it was about twelve grand yeah. for, for the month. Right. God, that would be like probably a couple hundred K at least. A couple hundred thousand, you I know, think, yeah. In a, in a U.S. hospital. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. Well, and, cool. You know, and, um, and again, uh, you should not trust what I say about Thai medical care, but there are websites that rate countries' medical systems according to international standards. Right. And so you can just see how Thailand is rated, and it is considered one of the best deals in the world. Like, I've seen these international ratings where, guy, like, you know, they have these, like, teams of, like, from the EU that come in and, and, and they, you know, they examine the hospitals. And Thailand's a uh, very good deal in terms of quality and cost it's right. very it's right. very very good um now some of the surrounding countries are are bad you know right. so it's like right. if you um you know i was reading a, a a travel book on laos you know to the northeast you know of thailand is uh, the country of laos and then to the east is cambodia and pretty much the travel books tell you like if you get injured in laos like get over the border into thailand right like they <laughs> just said like don't go right, see a right. doctor there right just Whatever happens, if you're sick or if you break your leg, whatever it is, sure, just sure. get over the border. Gotcha. You know, you don't want to go to a hospital there. Right. Well, that's interesting to kind of just understand. And I kind of have seen it the last couple of years I've been here. I can, I can kind of feel like, you know, you see that there's some kind of medical tourism. And, you know, if you're looking for an, like a very expensive operation, but it's a scheduled thing, like for your knee or something, you know. People come over here and, and do it to lower the cost. And they, they feel like yeah, they that's get very, a whole, very high health care, you know. That's right. Yeah, that's a whole nother kind of... Uh, I don't know, genre of medical care is that because it's so much cheaper, you get people coming over here essentially on like medical holidays. Yeah. Um, Now there are downsides to it. Like I think, so, so first off, I think the quality is high, but it's, it's not the Cleveland clinic and it's not the university hospital. Yeah. Right. Like it's not, it's not, I, I, I would say, I would say it's meets international standards, but that's not necessarily the same as saying it's like world class. That's right. Yeah. You know, so it's, right. it's not the best medical care in the world. Right. right you know. Right. So that's number one. Uh, you got to know. That. Like so. So especially if you have some really complex thing, you, you want to be in in the clinic. Like sure. you, you you don't want to be here. Right. right. Um, but but the second thing also is the legal system is very 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 different. And so what we're used to in the states is knowing that if something goes wrong, you know. Uh, like there is this whole system of, of compensation there, right. uh, whether it's through insurance or through litigation. And, and we know in the U.S. that the, like the payouts for like medical malpractice are very high. Right. So we know if, right. if someone makes a serious mistake and messes you up, it's millions, you're, you're going to get millions of dollars in, right. in compensation. Right. Um, Thailand has 
almost nothing like that. Almost nothing. And so this is, I think... Um, so that's part of why the costs are lower overall, right? The, I mean, why, probably. why the costs are higher in the U.S. Of course, I mean, right? probably. I mean, right. it, you know, it, it, uh, you know, there's a lot of variables. But uh, right. so if something goes seriously wrong here, um, you will be compensated. But my, my guess is, like, the amount of compensation would be something around, like, 5% of what it would be in the States. It's right, like, right. it's significantly less. Yeah, definitely. Um, and part, you know, part of it is, I'm sure obviously there's economic reasons, but I've noticed here uh, that some of it is cultural, where, where Thai people really have an attitude that shit just happens. Like it's just right. they, they they have a shit happens responsible for it. Or that's exactly right because of it or something. And, and, right. and you can see Thai people take a lot of risks that people in the states would never take. Uh, I mean, the the kind of cliche here is that you'll see um, a guy driving a motorbike with two or three of his little kids like in his lap on a motorbike in traffic. Little kids, like right. two year olds, three year olds, four right. year olds, no helmets, yeah, no, no shoes, hel- probably no hel- like in traffic, <laughs> right, with his own kids mm-hmm. and. Um, it, it, I don't know. It's re- it really takes your breath away when you see it. Like mm-hmm. the first time I've gotten kind of used to it. Right. But in, in general, um, if something goes wrong, uh, Thai people don't expect that the legal system is going to help them out. They just don't. Well, that's a good perspective. And, and I'm sure you have a, a, this kind of perspective that kind of is always this frame of reference that's always in your mind from your kind of legal training and just thinking about the two different worlds all the time, you know, the U.S. and, and Thailand. So, and, and speaking about that, Tell me how you got, you know, you went from kind of when you dropped in here teaching, you know, review courses, kind of Princeton review courses, SATs, TOEFLs, those kinds of things, to beginning to start teaching at the university that you're teaching at now, which is Thomas Hatt University, correct? That's right. That's right. Uh, basically, what happened is I uh, I was teaching here for several years. So just like I said, year after year, I was staying, you know, and so I, I was teaching several years and that, that exposed me to a lot of Thai students. So I was teaching Thais mostly who wanted to go to, uh, go to school in the States. So I was helping them get into universities in the States. And so I just became friends with a lot of Thai people, my, my students. And uh, I just one of them I was, I was friends with, I happened to express an interest. I was like, hey, I'm bored with this. I'd really like to teach at a university. Mm-hmm. And uh, she happened to know someone at a university just called Bangkok University. And Bangkok University is a pretty popular private university in Bangkok. And she literally just walked me in there. So she walked me into the international college oh, really? and introduced me to, to a bunch of people. And uh, I basically said, hey, I'm, I'm an American lawyer. You know, um, I'd like to teach something. And I, I basically got the job. And so I started teaching like a basic political science class. It was like political science 101 hmm. um, at the international college at Bangkok University. It's just called it's called Buick, B-U-I-C. I see. Uh, and, uh, and I was just part time. So I just taught one class there. Gotcha. I worked it out. I worked it out with my other company. So I was still kind of teaching full time, doing all this test stuff. And so I, I became like a part time college professor at Bangkok University, and I and, and and I loved it. So for me, it was it's more interesting than teaching the test stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but I learned a lot about the Thai university system, uh, and and uh, essentially, Bangkok University. I had some good students there, but I felt like um, it was not all that competitive it's really uh it, to me it wasn't really the students fault it was kind of the the way it was set up and you know this was a long time ago i guess things right. could have changed over there what's what style or what kind of level of university is, is bank bangkok university what would you liken it to something in the states is it like a tri c is it like a cleveland state or a, or a tough call i mean I, th- I think probably Ohio state or something it's really hard to uh it's really hard to compare levels like that uh but i i to me it's probably something more like a tri c um, it, it, and that's, and that's tri C like a Cuyahoga community college, sort of community college level. Tri C is only a two year school though. This is a four year school. Yeah, four year school. Um, and like I said, there were some good students there, but, um, the, in, in general, and you know, I, 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 you know, I, I think I'm allowed to say this, but in general, it's like the, just the entire Thai educational system, um, has a lot of work to do, I think, compared to not just U S systems, but just to meet international standards like the, the, the entire Thai educational system, especially outside of Bangkok has huge problems. Uh, so if you look at a meaning looking at like junior high and high school into college or just everything, just speaking college, the whole okay. system. Okay. I, I mean, if you look at like Thai students, uh, performance on international tests, even in things like math, which, you know, we have the stereotype that Asians are good at math and Thai, Thais are good at math in some respects, but just 
internationally they don't they don't perform very well and, and but a lot of the problem is this distinction we talked about before like bangkok schools tend to perform okay but outside of bangkok they tend to perform like yeah. v- very poorly yeah i think it's just like any any country like the smaller towns it's just a little bit tougher less resources less less population that makes you competitive you know the population makes you competitive that is true that you is know? true and so what happened so i was teaching at bangkok university part-time and i i just decided i wanted to check out um uh, like a, a, a kind of a more competitive university. And I had a buddy who was had a PhD in economics, and he was teaching at this university called Thammasat University, which is uh, considered one of the best universities in Thailand. A lot of people, uh, there was kind of like three big universities in Thailand that are traditionally that have good reputations, uh, Chula Longkorn, Thammasat, and, and a university called Mahidon University. Um, and of course, there's many others. But those are kind of the big three. Gotcha. And the, the the kind of traditional way people think about it is that Chula Longhorn is the best university and Thammasat is the second best. Um, it's kind of the, and so some people make analogies between like Harvard and Yale and, and things like that. Gotcha. Um, but it's actually way more complicated than that. Uh, it really depends on the program you're talking about. Right. And my experience, and uh, I'm not afraid to say it, even though I teach at Thammasat, just in my experience, um, when it comes to international programs, I I think that Mahidon has done a better job of of m- reaching international standards so I I've, I know some professors over there and uh, I've interacted with a lot of students and uh, and so my university now we're really trying to raise the standards uh, of the international program that I teach in uh, because because we don't have that many like I think at Thomas we only have about six programs in English completely at the university okay yeah so ex- explain that. I was just going to ask you what do you actually teach and do you teach in English yeah everything I teach is in English my, my tie is another whole another topic but my tie is basically horrible okay, you know, okay. This, that, that would be the well the short much better way. than mine but <laughs> <laughs> that would be the short way to say it is okay. my tie is horrible okay uh, uh but yeah so i couldn't teach i don't know why i could teach in thai so yeah so my uh so international programs in thailand 15 years ago were actually pretty rare like where maybe a university might have one or two programs in english but it was, right. since i've been in thailand international programs have kind of exploded so it's kind of it's, it's got they've gotten much so m- because they're taught in english is that kind of define what an international program is? Yeah, that's what I mean by international. So okay. By international, I mean it's taught in English. Okay, so because I, I would think that like in Thai, you know, if you're going to high school in Thailand, may, you might, some of those classes might get taught in English, no? Well, Because again, you're trying to learn, or they would just call that the international program or again, something. Again, I, I, I group it into three categories. Actually, this, this, is how I, this is how I understand my students that I see. I've got three categories. The first yep. category I call true Thai students. And that means they've been in Thai schools their whole life where everything's taught in, Eng- everything's taught in Thai except maybe an English class. Gotcha. So right. almost yeah. all Thais, almost all Thais, oh, maybe that's an exaggeration. My guess is 75% of Thais start studying English when they're kids. Like it might right. not be very good sure. if they're, you know, if they're outside of Bangkok, it might not be very quality, but I mean, Thai parents are smart. And so uh, like almost all Thais start English when they're pretty young. Um, but I call a true Thai student, someone who's been in a Thai program. And a, a, a lot of my students, uh, when they show up in my program at university, uh, they've, they have maybe, you know, 12 years of English, but they've never studied in an English program before. So they've only had English in English class. Right. Sure. Okay. You know, like, like, in the states, right. studying Spanish and yeah, Spanish. Yeah, I was going to say, if anybody remembers, like you know, their Spanish that they learned all four years in high school, like good for you because I don't remember that much. <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> that's you, what you I wouldn't did. Be, you wouldn't be able to then I'm using it every day. You know. Well, well, you wouldn't be able to then go to a Spanish university and study all your classes in Spanish. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Definitely not. <laughs> yeah. So what my students do is they show up and now they've got to study every everything in English. Right. Um, so that's a true Thai student. But then there's another category I call I call uh, international Thai students be, because Thailand does have. Uh, several, especially in Bangkok, several good international uh, uh, grade schools, grade schools and uh, high schools. So mm-hmm. it's like, you know, they, they're pretty expensive by Thai standards. Sure. But sure. some students start in international school in, in grade one, and they're essentially getting every class in English like right. for, for 12 years before they go to university. And then the third category of students is what I call a true international student, because some Thai students do go overseas either for high school or university. I see, right, you know, sure. So, so right. I, I, do, I do get, sometimes I get students in my college program who they went to high school in the States. Gotcha. You know. Gotcha. Okay, cool. So let's go back to, so tell me again, what, what are the topics that you're teaching or what are the classes that you're teaching? Good question. Yeah. <laughs> well, my program, uh, one thing, uh, one reason I love my job is that the program I teach in is quite unusual. My program is called 
British American Studies. And, it, and it's, it's actually one of the only programs like it in the whole world. It's basically a program designed to study just Britain and the United States. So, and, and, and this does exist at other schools. Like, mm-hmm. for, believe it or not, like you can, uh, outside of the U.S., you can get a degree in United States Studies. So, right. Sure. Yeah, so my, uh, one of my students who I just saw uh, last week, she got a master's degree uh, in London in U.S. studies, like her mm-hmm. master's in U.S. studies. Sure. But her undergraduate is in British and American studies. And so the, the, the good thing I like about it is it, it is isolated to those two countries, but we essentially are trying to teach everything about Britain and the U.S. So it's everything from culture. So we have classes in film and music and pop culture, um, all the way to economics and things like that, which mm-hmm. are like harder social science kind of stuff and my since my background is in political science and law i'm kind of the political science law guy so i teach you know i teach government and i teach some history classes but because we only have uh we've only got five we've only got five full-time professors and a really broad range of classes i'm in one of those programs where they basically just uh point to something on the syllabus and say can you teach this (laughs) i see you know, so uh, over the years, so I've been at my university for eight years now, uh, and the last time I counted, I've taught nineteen different courses. Yeah, wow, that's uh, pretty cool. Yeah, so for, as a teacher, um, uh, although my salary is not particularly good, uh, <laughs> just as a, from a pure teaching standpoint, uh, it's pretty cool because I, I, yeah. I, I teach a huge variety of, of classes. I was gonna say it's nice to have the variety because, like, you yes. know, once you get something under your belt, it's cool to probably teach it at, you know, a few semesters, but then you're like, oh, yeah, right. and then, yeah, and then it's I, nice to have a change up. You yeah, know? usually I can switch and teach something else. Yeah, yeah cool. So what was, the one pro- what was the one course you were telling me that you developed on your own, this like logic or reasoning course? Yeah. That you thought a, was yeah, interesting. It's interesting. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. So um, uh, about uh, a year after I got there, um, they assigned to me a seminar class. And the seminar class is like the, the, the gem to get assigned because essentially the seminar class – uh, the teacher is allowed to teach whatever they want as long as it gets approved by the faculty. And so I was trying to figure out what I wanted to teach in the seminar class. And I've always had an interest in uh, skepticism and critical thinking. And so I've always, um, not always, but like at, at some point in my life, I, I began to doubt supernatural things. I began to doubt like psychic powers. And, you know, you know I went through this whole phase where, you know, I was reading all these books on Bigfoot and trying to figure out if Bigfoot was real. So I, 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 I had, you know, <laughs> I had this like kind of side interest in skepticism. Right. And then being in Thailand, uh, you know, Thailand is a pretty superstitious country mm-hmm. overall. Okay. And so I, I was fascinated by students of mine who, uh, on the one hand, were very good students and could kind of think logically in one realm. But, but then still hold some pretty superstitious beliefs. Right. Uh, like, for example, well, you'll appreciate this. I, I was teaching a, um, uh, a GRE class, and this guy was a super bright guy. Uh, uh, had gone to a Chula Longhorn undergrad engineer at Chula Longhorn, which has a very good engineering program, and uh, was scoring quite, quite high in the GRE. And uh, his dream was to go to MIT. I remember chatting with him, and... I was, he asked me what I teach at the university and I started talking about this critical thinking class I teach and skepticism. And, um, I just threw out, you know, we discussed stuff like are ghosts real and like, how do you know if ghosts are real or not? And, uh, it was fascinating because, uh, he immediately said, well, of course they're real, you know, and we just kept talking and and I, that was, that was his gut reaction of, well, of course they're real. Well, yeah, it was, it was fascinating to me. It was fascinating to me to be talking to this guy who's obviously highly intelligent. Yeah. On top of that, he has like scientific slash engineering training. Right. You know, he's, he's not just a high IQ guy who, right. who, who studies literature. Right. You know we, you know, we tend to think of like, you know, liberal arts as being softer or whatever. But here's this kind of hard science guy. And he's just, uh, just believes in ghosts. And, you right. know, which is not unheard of in the States, but it would be... Right. I think it would be rarer, especially among a science-oriented person. Uh, perhaps, perhaps. You know, it would be rarer, I yeah, think. Probably and, rarer. Um, it was by, by the way, we don't want to offend any ghost believers out there. <laughs> <laughs> we were just giving an example of uh, just a course, and, and there, is, there is sort of like the spiritual, I don't know how you would describe the, like the spirit houses they have here in Thailand, and there's this, there is a culture of... Yeah, I mean, uh, well, well it, it, actually, I'm glad you brought up this whole question of, of possibly offending people, because when I, when I first started... T- teaching the class I, I was i was very worried about potentially offending students and right. you know and uh and for one thing that 
I got into skepticism uh, in the United States, you know, so it's like I, I didn't it's not like I came here and I was like, oh, wow, these people are superstitious. Uh, I'm going to be a skeptic. It wasn't like that. Like right. skepticism is was, uh, you know, is, you know, the, um, there's a skeptic society in the U.S. Like I've always been a big fan of uh, a guy named James Randi. There's a guy named Michael Shermer. There's a whole world of like rationality and skepticism in the u.s right that's and right. so I, I that was this that just happened to be part of my that's kind of where you were coming from yeah. versus like a reaction to being here that's for exactly right. right and okay. so when i uh i was very careful when i wrote the curriculum the first time to frame everything as like these are like human questions right you know and so right. you know you know we spend time on just human psychology cognitive biases you know the placebo effect all that stuff that are that's really human right you know it's not it's not a tie thing right and um i gotta tell you um I, the, overall, the course was like a big success. I was a little worried, even if I didn't offend students, I was a little bit worried they just might not be into it. Right. Sure. Like they just might not understand it or might under- not be interested in taking it or just. Yeah. Get into and it. Uh, basically, I mean, more or less, my students love it. And, and, and so hmm. that cool. so so I taught it as a seminar for a few years and it was pretty popular. And then my faculty approached me and asked if I wanted to sit on a committee that was going to develop a larger curriculum. I think the university already had an idea to do a critical thinking class. Uh, so they didn't get that from me. But then they saw that I was teaching the seminar. So they asked me to sit on the committee that wrote the curriculum and I ended up helping out a lot. And so um, it ended up after a couple of years of work, it ended up being a, now a required freshman class for all freshmen at Tamasat, in, whether in the Thai programs or international programs. Oh, really? Wow. So now there's cool. about, I think we've got about 8,000, uh, actually maybe not met that many freshmen. I'm not sure how many, freshmen, but basically all Tamasat students now have to take a, a critical thinking class. Um, wow. And so, we, which I is had that part. all because of you, basically? No, well, like I said, I think they had a... Well, like I You're said... making they, like your imprint here in, uh, in Well, Bangkok. no, I, I think I did make my imprint on the class. Well, like I said, yeah. I think the university had this plan and then... Uh, and then, and then through my, my boss saw that I was already teaching it and that kind of got me on the committee. And then on the committee, uh, I had a little bit of an advantage because, uh, you know, we were sitting in this meeting discussing like, what should we, what should we teach? And I was just like, all right, here's my pile of stuff I have already. Right, right. So I, I walked in with- So you were in the right place, the right time. Yeah, so I thing, already right. had materials. And so we, we set up a system where all the professors could contribute their own materials it's just I happen to have a lot of input on it. Sure, sure. Uh, and so um, there's now uh, because it's it's because it's uh, it's taught uh, uh, to the whole university. I think we've got about 15 different professors who teach the course. Um, and so I, I still teach. So I, I so I had to kind of uh, move my class from being an upper level seminar class, and now it's like a freshman class. So I taught it last semester. So now it's been uh, seven years. I've been teaching critical thinking and skepticism to to Thai students. Wow, that's interesting. Well, speaking about putting your uh, imprint on things and having an impact here in Thailand, especially in the international community and the expat community, uh, that now you recently told me it was recently announced that you're taking over uh, or, being, or becoming a co-host of the Bangkok podcast. That is which correct. Is, which is for expats. That is right. So, how, so how, we have to talk about this. How did this happen and how did... How did you get involved in this, and how are you now going to become a podcaster? I think it's kind of funny because I started this podcast, and I didn't yeah. know until I got here this time that all of a sudden it's like Ed is going to be on his own podcast now. So. That's right. Yeah, it's really because <laughs> last year when you were kind of discussing maybe doing a podcast, it was not anywhere on my radar at all. Like I just right. like, was not thinking about it at all. But uh, uh, obviously, I've been here a long time, so I do actually have some friends. And uh, uh, one of my good friends is a Canadian guy named Greg Jorgensen, and he's another longtime expat. And uh, he started the Bangkok podcast, I think, about three or four years ago. And so it's already gone through uh, several seasons. Mm-hmm. And um, Greg is, uh, is kind of one of those guys. He's just a, a connector. Uh, and he's, uh, he, he had a lot of interesting contacts here. And he came up with a, a podcast that uh, was to focus on expats in Bangkok. So mm-hmm. it, we, we don't really necessarily cover the whole country. Uh, and it's not really focused towards tourists, although some of the shows uh, w- would apply equally to tourists. Like, so we, we might do something on healthcare, right. which tourists could be worried about as well as you know expats. I gotcha. And uh, we haven't, I haven't formally started yet, but uh, I did do kind of an introductory episode. So if, if you just if you just go to bangkokpodcast.com, and it's also on, very easy to find on Facebook. Uh, you can uh, get links to the episodes, and uh, so I did an episode uh, on the Thai smile, like the culture, the cultural practice of Thai smiling a lot. So we, <laughs> we, we, we did a show on that. So that was right. kind of that was kind of my intro, and uh, uh, officially I'm going to start uh, in uh, about two weeks. 
So how, how do you, are you doing any preparation for it or you, do you have like a editorial schedule or how does, how do the episodes come about in terms of working on the, working on that podcast? Well, I'm listening to some high quality podcasts like Jim Jim's reinvention revolution. Absolutely. Thank just, you. Just Appreciate get, that. Just to get some <laughs> pointers to figure out how it's done. Right. Uh, no, it's funny because uh, I've always uh, listened to a few podcasts that I like, but they tend to be really well known ones like rogan like joe rogan's podcast and stuff like that but i'm so i'm not really a podcast guy like i'm not like someone like right my friends are into podcasts they follow they listen to like 30 of them right you know right i've always listened to like two or three like <laughs> gotcha. e e even the bangkok podcast which i like i knew my buddy greg had this bangkok podcast thing but it's like i i, I think i tuned into a couple episodes and it just whatever you know it's just not my thing listening to podcasts wasn't my thing um but he uh he has a greg has a system where essentially he gets a different co-host every season uh, and the season kind of season is roughly a year to a year and a half depending on the, the availability of the co-host so uh he had uh he's basically had two seasons and uh, he he mentioned to me a few months ago that his co-host was leaving mm -hmm. uh and he asked me if i was into it and i, I told him at first i really was gonna have to study it because like i said I, I wasn't really a podcast guy so i started listening more mm -hmm. and uh i thought it'd be interesting so I'm going to give it a whirl. Yeah, that's cool, man. Well, I'm, I'm excited for you, and I'm excited because it's it seems like it's the definitive Bangkok podcast, you know, expats. It's, it's in English, obviously, uh, for the international crowd or people that are living here. It seems like it's the go-to, right? It's pretty popular. Uh, yeah. You know, Greg has done a good job of building up the uh, uh, the listeners, so there's, there's a pretty steady group of people who listen. Uh, they also do meetups, and the meetups uh, are, are pretty popular, mm -hmm. you know, the expat community in Thailand, or especially I should say in Bangkok, is pretty tight. It's 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 very easy to come here and immediately meet a group of of, of international people. Right. Uh, you know, it's, it's very like I like I said before, the culture shock coming here is pretty low. Mm -hmm. Like there's just like systems in place for you to like, you know, whether it's you know, hotels, hospitals, uh, malls. And then these meetups, and it's just very easy, I think, to get integrated here. Right. Now, the longer you're here, the more you will experience culture shock. But at first, it's pretty easy. Right, yeah. That's, that's what I tell people, too. It's like, this is an easy place to drop into if you haven't, like, done a lot of international traveling, for example. Uh, just the systems and where the transportation is. But, yeah. But then kind of beyond that, yeah. uh, like you said, you, you start <laughs> noticing things or getting involved in different, you know, situations where you're like, wow. Yeah. There's a, uh, yeah, this is uh, not the West, yeah, we're, we're not we're not in the West. No, <laughs> yeah, there's some big differences. Different things there. going on, but yeah. So that's so that's really cool. So I'm looking forward to checking that out. Do you know when your first episode is going to be released? Uh, when, I'm going to so say start I'm going to say about. I think we've got to record uh, in a week and a half. And so basically, my first episode, other than the brief intro I did, will be in two weeks. I see. Okay, so maybe by the time I get this episode released, yeah, <laughs> uh, people will be able to, to yeah check out probably Bangkok listen podcast. to your yeah listen to your first episode for cause, sure because this will probably take me a, you know a week or two to to get produced i got one one in the can coming already so cool well you know we've got a, a, a few minutes left but i got a couple of questions before we before we get out of here that i like to ask folks and and one is uh kind of the role you see of and especially you because you have this background and interest in technology one is you know as as it, technology keeps evolving and it's kind of forcing these different business models and different reinventions of the world te technologically speaking how are you dealing with it in terms of you know being here as an expat or being into you know digital photography or you know kind of you know the, the gadget universe what do you what what's you know do, are you struggling with anything are you seeing any any weirdness in the in the universe in this regard these days well uh you know as a gadget uh like addict like horrible i'm a horrible gadget addict uh, Thailand is good in the sense that you can buy almost anything here, so you don't you don't necessarily have to deal with, oh, I can't find this gadget, but everything is priced higher here, so it's quite frustrating. Mm. You know, it's just driving me crazy. Like I was just looking right. at a new uh, digital camera. Like like photographers out there will know. Like Sony's coming out with this new camera, the A7 III, and it's uh you know it's two thousand dollars in the states, and I was just checking prices here, and the, the prices aren't totally set, but it, it was going to be like probably a three or four hundred dollar markup here, and it's just kind of there's uh, like. And, and that's, I actually was worried it was going to be even more like, and so I think, um, I think that, uh, Thailand in general has pretty high import taxes on technology because they think of them as luxury items. And so it's kind of, it's kind of a tax on the wealthy here in Thailand. Yeah. Which is kind of a little bit, uh, you know, unexpected. I think for me anyways, I thought, 
I could get some good deals when I, when I would come over here on stuff that I'd be interested in. But it turns out that that's not generally really, no. Yeah, it's not really the case. It, <laughs> so it, this it, is not the place to come for especially for not goods. technology. Especially yeah. not technology. I mean, I think that uh, I mean just through friends or my sisters. Like I think like stuff like uh, like clothes and stuff like that. There are some great deals here. Like you know, you know, it's, it's a great place for like you know. Th- that kind of stuff but technology wise uh you know I-, I was in the past i've actually flown to singapore to buy something and then get back on a plane i've done it i did it one time i flew to singapore bought a new camera and flew back and saved money <laughs> oh that's kind of crazy yeah, yeah. well they do have cheap flights to singapore yeah that's true well i remember like i brought i brought you you did brought me you brought me my g85 which i use right now yeah right yeah, yeah. i brought, brought brought from the states you ordered it and then yeah. I, I carried it over here for you because it was yeah. cheaper to do it that way when I that's was exactly right yeah so, well, wow, that's a good point. So that's something I wouldn't have uh, thought about. So, yeah, great, great perspective uh, for people that are listening out there. Uh, and my, my next question is, as you're here longer or as you're thinking about kind of going forward, what are one, you know, one or two tips that you would kind of mention to people out there about how to keep reinventing yourself? So you, you've had this massive reinvention, you know, early on just dropping into Thailand and then figuring your way around and then getting into university life and expat life and then this new reinvention with uh, becoming a podcaster soon here. Well, you know, how do you keep your mind open or, or how do you keep uh, open to oppor- opportunities? You know, I don't know. Uh, like, you know, I, I, you know, part of my job is also giving advice to students. You know, as a professor, I, I have to kind of guide students. And what, one, one of my jokes I have with them is that like, you, you know, there, there's sometimes there's like two pieces of wisdom that they both sound fine on their own. But they actually contradict each other. So it's like, like, like on the on the one hand, it's like you get advice like you know, look before you leap, you know. And then we have other advice like, uh, he who hesitates is lost. And you're like, well, what is it? Like, <laughs> right. well, like, what is it? Like, do yeah. I do I am I cautious or do I do I jump in? Like, what do I do? Right. And, right. and uh, all I can say is, for me, uh, a big thing for me was taking a flyer and kind of acting somewhat randomly. Like when I when I. When I moved here, granted, it was only supposed to be for a year, mm-hmm. but for me, it was throwing up my hands at the idea that I'm going to be able to figure my life out. Like for me, it was like, right. I have no, I, it was just like me at, you know, I was in my early thirties. It was me saying like, I cannot figure my life out. I just, I don't know. I was just like, for me, it was just like, I have no idea who I am, like what I'm doing, where I'm going, what I want. Right. I have no idea so I'm just going to take this job on the other side of the world and see what happens. And for me, it, for me, I think it turned out good, you know? Um, and so I, I wouldn't call it like random behavior. I mean, I, I, I had a job when I came here, so it's like, you know, so I'm not like some people who do show up and got off the plane and have nothing. So I did have a job, which, which, you know, I, I've looked at my experience over the years compared to some other expats. And I now realize what a big advantage that was because, mm-hmm. because I had a, like a Thai employer yeah. and I was like legal from the beginning. Right. Um, that gave me some big advantages that I didn't, that I didn't even realize at the time because what, what, what some other expats have to deal with here is, um, trying to figure out a way to stay legal and, you know, you know, and, and wrestling with like the visa process and having to make border runs. And, 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 right. and, and I think what happens to some expats is they, they, they get sick of dealing with that. You know, so so my my friends or people who come and they stay for one or two years, a lot of times it's because they don't they don't really ha- they don't really have a legitimate reason for being here, which means they end up having to either bend or break like visa rules and and they put themselves in questionable legal positions, right? Or, or they or they have to do things like you know renew three month tourist visas for two years, you know, stuff like that. Right. Um, and a lot of times what happens with that is they'll change a regulation and say it can't be renewed, or they'll say that. Uh, it can't be renewed over the border, and so you know then you have to start flying to Singapore to renew it, and then and and then and then the Singaporean embassy, uh, the Thai embassy, will start saying we're not going to do that anymore, and then they'll have to, and then people have to fly to the states to get like you know you know right. so I think people get tangled up in in the in the rules and regulations as an expat, and if if you just if you have a like a legitimate job, um, you just have you have an advantage, right, right, yeah, you get plugged into the system, so. So, so, so I, yeah, so I didn't act completely randomly. Right. You know, I, I didn't just get, I, on, I didn't just get on a plane. Right. Right. I did have a job. Yeah. Right. Well, that, I mean that, well, that's an interesting notion in terms of, it, it just speaks to that, I guess really like inner conflict when you know you need to change something up in your life. Right. You know, you need to change, you know, you're thinking like maybe I need to do something different, you know, 
going forward or I'm not, I, I feel like I'm complacent or I'm not getting enough out of life or whatever it might be, what you're thinking, or I need to make more money or whatever it might be. But yeah, this, you have this conflict, this internal conflict of, yeah, do I just dive in and be crazy? Or in some measured way, is it a measured risk or whatever? And you know what? I think that's the only thing you can do is answer that for yourself internally. Because externally, when people are watching you, you know, like me as your, as your friend, you're thinking like, what, what's he doing? You know? right. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, like, yeah. When I, yeah, when I took the job and said I was moving to Thailand, I got a lot of strange looks. Like, you're going where? Right. Like, you're right. doing what? You know? Right. And yeah, that, that's something you just have to figure out on your own. So very interesting. Well, Ed, thanks for being on the podcast. I, I really appreciate it. And I can't wait to get to where are we going again? We are going to Ayutthaya. Ayutthaya. Okay, I got to remember the name of that. So Yeah, well, your listeners will probably see some pictures on your, on your website. Absolutely. Taken by yourself. That's right. That'd be great. Okay, cool. Thanks. All right, man. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution Podcast. If you want to hear more, join our mailing list at Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution.com. See you next time. And remember, the revolution has just begun. So dig in, embrace the process of reinvention, and start realizing the success you've always dreamed of.